Lakeland Public Television presents Currents, sponsored by Nisswa Tax Service, offering tax preparation for individuals and businesses across from the City Hall in Nisswa and on the web at nisswatax.com. Good evening. Welcome to a special edition of Lakeland Currents. I'm Bethany Wesley. Tonight we come to you from our Bemidji studio, where I welcome Craig Collison as our guest. Craig is the Transportation District Engineer for the Minnesota Department of Transportation in Region 2. Region 2 is headquartered in Bemidji but covers parts of or all of 14 counties in northwestern Minnesota. Craig has kindly agreed to be our guest today so we can discuss some transportation issues, some planning, and funding considerations as we look toward the 2016 legislative session. Transportation is no doubt going to be a key topic down at the legislature this year. Last year, the legislature approved the budget but did not approve a transportation package. Minnesota's transportation system is the fifth largest in the nation and it is coming of age. Half of the state's highways are 50 years or older and one third of the state's bridges are 50 years or older. This year, with a budget surplus of $1.2 billion, transportation will continue to be a topic at the legislature. And so we welcome Craig as our guest. Thank you for joining us. So first, let's just dive in. Tell us a little bit about what your role is at MnDOT and what it is you do. Okay, well, as a district engineer, I'm fortunate I get to work with a lot of talented people. Um, and we work primarily with the state highway system, which you know, we uncover the maintenance that's done on the work, the bridge repairs that have done on the work, the construction projects you see. We don't do the construction, that's, usually, that's contracted out to contractors, but we do the design, the project administration. There, we are also a funding stream for we have a state aid division that works with cities and counties where state aid goes through. We have people that work with transit that fund local transit um, through the state system. How long you know, have you been with MnDOT? I've been working for MnDOT for uh, 32 years now. I've been fortunate I've been in Bemidji for the last 29. Okay. So. I want to talk a little bit to start with about how we go about planning for projects. Okay. So I know obviously the season's coming up not too long from now, but you know next year and the year after right. that. So how far into advance is MnDOT usually planning for world work? Well, if it, we have many different plans, but if you look at the general state plan, starting in 2010, we were directed by the legislature and we have a 20 year plan. Now, that doesn't mean we are talking about projects 20 years from now, but we really look at what, what's our general revenue? What do we think we're going to have for funding? And what kind of funding splits should we be using? You know, we look, kind of break that into two, year, two periods, the first 10 years okay. and the second 10 years. The first 10 years are much more firm on what we expect for money. But out of that plan, and it's a quite a thick document, <laughs> um, it sets general spending. How much should we be spending for road and bridge? How much should we be spending for expansion? What should we be spending for safety? Now that's then directed down to the districts and we take that and then get more specific. Okay. And in that we'll have a four year, the first four years now are what we'll call our STIP. That's actually we've identified projects, we've scheduled them, we have a cost for them. Okay. That's the first four years. Then that's the four. next okay. six years of that 10 year period we'll be starting to identify projects because some of the larger projects takes many years to deliver. But it's also um, an example, we start looking at our pavement work because if we're going through a community, we need to engage that community to say, are there other things that the city needs to work on? Um, right now, we were just down and talked to, I had staff down talking to Hackensack. They're out in that 2021, 2022 period, which sounds like a long ways away, but if they have city utilities that need to be repaired, they have to have time to decide what needs to be fixed, uh, where do they find money, get to help work on his design. It takes time to get that all done. So it sounds like it's a, a partnership then with many times with your local entities. Just ev every time we go through a city, it's a partnership. Okay. Um, we don't always do the same thing, but we try to talk to them about what the other needs are. Uh, we have to stay fiscally grounded. So sometimes there's many more needs than there is money. So looking at like last year, one of the bigger projects right. or something that people saw was right. 2 and 89. Yep. So obviously you knew that was coming for how many years? How far in we advance were, were they looking? We'd been talking about that for about six years. Okay. It got in the stip in the fourth year okay. when we could finally actually find money for it. But you know, when we look at, we use many different things to identify projects. We look at pavement condition. We look at bridge condition. We also have a whole database of crash statistics. Oh, yeah. Where crashes occurring? What type of crashes are they? Uh, 
when does an intersection reach the point where we actually need to do something, that we can find something to do? And that intersection is an example. That, if you looked at crash rates, which are crashes per a million vehicle miles traveled, that's kind of a random, big statistic, but that one was actually third in the state on rate. Oh, wow. Now, it didn't have the crash numbers of some of the Metro ones or some of the other, but it was a very large concern. And those are what we call a sustained crash location. We know you over a 10 year period, we continually have crashes. Okay. A lot of our roads, you know, we'll have uh, intersections that some may be familiar. There may be one crash every 10 years. So it's, it's harder to identify a need there. So it's really those high cost ones, and that's what drove that. Okay, interesting. Yeah. So then when you look at going forward with planning a project, do you also engage the public? Do you reach out so they know what's coming up, so businesses, residents yeah. alike kind of have an idea? Yes, as soon as we can start identifying a project, now we may do some background work, but depending on the project, we have to engage in any community, businesses, you know, what's gonna be the impact because uh, the business goes past their front door, they have to go down the road to get there. Mm -hmm. um, if we're looking at a partnership with the city, we need to give them time to find financing. So that may be five or six years out. Okay. Uh, we'll start some of the public information at four years out, okay. and we'll continue that through the project. It varies depending on the project. Okay. So. I know one of them, correct me if I'm wrong, but last month you were just reaching out to like the Park Rapids area, because there's a discussion yeah. about possibly, possibly turning 71 at that intersection yep. into a roundabout. Yep, and there's an intersection. We, we could see there were, uh, there were some crash issues yeah. there. Uh, there's been a lot of concern by the public, and we've heard that through the city council, through people contacting our office, and we do listen to that. You know, we, we do go meet with the cities and talk to them what are their issues, and the roundabout there was because there is a crash issue. I wouldn't say it's a problem because it doesn't rise quite, that's kind of maybe semantics, but it doesn't rise to have to do something right now. Sure. We know it's a trend that we're looking at, and there we looked at a number of options. We looked at, could we just put a left turn lane in? Now, that would work today, mm -hmm. but Park Rapids is one of those communities that's continuing to grow. So do we do a little fix, or do we do it with a bigger fix, like a roundabout? And that was part of the discussion we were having with the public is, what, what do they see are issues? Because the roundabouts are, um, something people are going to see more of around the state. We know that they do, re they do reduce the severity of a crash, and that's really what we're after. Yeah, it reduces the, the dramatic. Right, and, and, the and they work well, like if you're coming in from the south side of Park Rapids. Let's say we put a signal light in there. We know when we put a traffic signal in, if they're warranted, um, they'll often drive up the crash numbers because people don't always stop for them, especially the first one in town. Mm -hmm. um, and then when the signal's green, people don't slow down. Okay. Where a roundabout is gonna bring people down to that posted speed limit, you're gonna have to go slow, it calms the traffic calms down, the and it does work. Okay. Um, where they've been tried around the state, the severe accidents largely go away, and that's really what the intent is. So when you're planning for the district, because you have a yep. pretty large district, I mean, most yeah. of 14 counties, a yeah. pretty large district, how do you go about balancing the projects so different areas of the district are being, getting strong roads, getting well, good roadways? Well, we, again, when we're looking at the preservation, the pavement numbers, we tend to follow how they were built. So there's years like this year in Bemidji, we're not going to have much construction. But last year we had a fair amount. We had two in 89, we did 371, from Cass Lake to Walker. Mm -hmm. We did the work out east of Cass Lake on Highway 2. It's where the pavement needs are. Okay. Then we will also be looking at the safety or a community that has a um, other need. Uh, a couple of years we're gonna be in Kellier where they had a water line issue that they needed to replace their utilities which happened to go under the state highway. So we're working cooperative them with them to rebuild the road at the same time, so we get a good quality project. Okay. So it's 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 condition warranted. It's also a little opportunity. Okay. You know. Is that similar then too for balancing metro versus out state? Uh, a, little bit, a, a little bit. A little bit. Right now we do some statewide planning, where we try to balance across the state because we don't want a big spike in construction on this part of the district then go state of the go away because it's very hard to deliver. But you also look at population. About 50% of the population is in the metro area, and it, the funding splits kind of follow that. 
Okay. That very rough number. Okay. It may go up and down depending on the conditions a little bit. Are the needs, transportation needs unique in larger like regional centers or what, you know, like your little, your metropolitan areas like Bemidji's and your Crookston's, are they unique in those areas? Well, they are because you're seeing some pedestrian, you're also seeing growth, but the real challenge is every road's important to somebody. If you're in northern Minnesota, you're the, our district, and one thing, you know, I keep explaining to people that aren't from this part of the state is our district's the size of Vermont and New Hampshire combined. So you think of the land area we're covering, but there are major industries up here. Um, we have ma major manufacturing, we also have timber, we also have agriculture. So these roads need to support that. But what we're seeing is, well, and we've been seeing it for a long time, it's continue, is population shift. They're moving out of the rural areas towards the regional centers, okay. which then create some traffic issues or growth so issues or, um, we are seeing pedestrian movements more and more that people are asking for. Okay, and I think if I remember right, one yeah. of the projects coming up this season is actually a pedestrian sidewalk going yeah. through Bemidji. It's a, it's a very, we're a very small project. At okay. the new apartment buildings that are going up by the college, oh, okay. the developer came forward and said, what can we do cooperatively to improve the sidewalks in front of the building? So we're working okay. with him. Uh, great on Another partnership. first very small project. Next summer, we will be working on the one-way pairs downtown because we have to do a resurfacing project. But that's the other part of our pedestrian is the Americans with Disability Act has been around a long time. Um, I think 1991 was when it started. Okay. Part of that is we need to address for people that are <laughs> maybe in a wheelchair, maybe visually impaired. Um, and what we know what we built when we built these originally is we didn't fully understand how, what that would take. So now we're coming back in and redoing a lot of the corners, but we're also looking at the sidewalks. If the cross slope is too steep or if there's a driveway entrance, it's too steep for somebody in a wheelchair. Okay. But if you think how our society has changed, 30 years ago, you very rarely saw somebody out in a wheelchair. Now with technology, with the motorized wheelchairs, there's many people out, which is great but that's a service we need to look at and say where are the barriers as we, that we have as a society. Mm -hmm. And we actually as a department have been looking at it. If you talked to us three years ago, it was going to take us 50 years to address all the needs. And we said that's too long. So now we're trying to reemphasize how do we address those on a shorter timeline? Where's the priorities? Sure, okay. So. I wanna move a little bit more toward yeah. like the funding and the legislative yep. session a little bit. So, you know, Last year they approved the budget, but they didn't improve the transportation package. Now I know that yeah. you guys, because you're always planning into the future, did that affect the season then, not having that package kind of finalized, or how, what was the impact? Well, the, the impact is probably more in the future. Okay. You know, there, it takes more than a year to develop most of our projects, and if we're buying right away, we're talking three to four years. So okay. a major project takes time. But not having a predictable long-term funding is a problem, not only for the state, for the, the local units of government that have roads and, and all the other transportation infrastructure. Because sitting in my chair or sitting in our planner's chair, do we make a short-term investment? Because that's what we're gonna have to do with the funding we have, or can we afford to do a, a more robust fix or a longer-term fix? And that has to be known fairly early. Okay. Because that may change the scope of the project quite a bit. Okay. So, and every year they, that the decision to fund transportation is delayed, that need doesn't disappear. Okay. It accumulates. So if the bill, if the proposal was six billion dollars over ten years, that's six hundred million dollars a year. That need just got added on. Okay. It's going to continue to grow. Okay. So if they, if you don't have the money then right away or for that for that time frame right. to do the picks, are you finding that roads that could have had small fixes along the way now need maybe a bigger project because they weren't getting that maintenance? That, that's what the ultimate will happen. Okay. Oh, if you look at our funding splits in our plan, for the next 10 years, about two thirds of the money goes to pavement and bridge and other infrastructure uh, preservation work. Okay. After that first 10 year cycle, almost all the money has to go there. And even with that spending, we know the condition is gonna gradually deteriorate. So yes, you're gonna go from shorter less expensive fixes, you're gonna to have to do larger fixes as the condition gets worse. Okay, okay. Yeah. Um, 
what is MnDOT's role in the legislative process? I mean, are you are you going out and talking to legislators and lobbying, or is that kind of handled down there? Or how? That, that is more the commissioner's role. Okay. My I see my role as more of discussing the need, okay. discussing how we would use the money. Uh, the actual determining where the funding comes from is really between the governor, the commissioner, and the legislature. Okay. Because they have to balance all the needs across society. So sure. Okay. That's a challenge. You know, I talked at the very beginning that there's that projected $6 billion mm -hmm. gap in the 10 years, and I wanted to make sure I had this right, but the Minnesota State Highway Investment Plan, right, MNSHIP, yep. actually predicts $16.2 billion over 20 years, right, 18 right. to 37. Yep. And so that's a big number. That's a huge yeah. number. You know, the, the numbers are quite realistic. They're just almost mind-boggling. Right. And, and these are not numbers that are to build us a system that satisfies everybody's need. This is to build a very fiscally constrained system, and that really only talks about the needs on the state system. Okay. There's an equally big need on the local unit of government needs. You know, the county roads, the city streets, mm -hmm. all of that is the same age. And I think what we've been hearing a lot from those local cities and local counties is that they want, they want a dedicated funding system. I mean, they want to know what's coming and so they don't have to go through this every, every well, so often. The same planning cycle is what, do you, what kind of investment, what can you afford to build? But the other one is, you know, there's been talk of a general fund use. And I know from sitting in my chair that raises some concern because in 2003 that's what was done. We did bonding with general fund money. Two years later, when the state economy was a little slower and the general fund had a shortfall, that money went back to the general fund. Oh. Those pro bonds then had to be paid out of the, the normal transportation funding, which didn't have the money there, so some project had to get cut. Okay. It really didn't cut, everything just got pushed into the future. So you, you add to that need in the future. So that's the big concern about bond, of general fund. Okay. No. And maybe we should talk just a little bit about some of the proposals. They've been out there, you know, the two yep. parties have come out in the last few weeks and kind of said what they would like to do. Um, the Senate DFLers have talked about a gas tax increase of at least 16 cents per gallon, plus increasing vehicle registration fees. And I think when they proposed that last year, they were projecting it would raise about $11 billion over a decade. S somewhere in that range, okay. yes. If there's been so many funding proposals, it's hard to... <laughs> it's hard to keep them all, yeah. all straight. Now, are there advantages and disadvantages to using a gas tax? Well, we know right now the gas tax is a shrinking amount of money because vehicle miles traveled, the, how, where the money comes from, it hasn't been going up at the same rate of inflation. We also know vehicles are getting more efficient. So I know the government, one of the commissioner's proposals last October was a number of states last year switched from a cent per gallon okay. to more of a percentage, more of a sales tax basis on the fuel. Okay. If you look at our costs, the cost to build construction are very tied to fuel costs. It costs a lot of diesel to do construction. Asphalt comes from an oil product. So it's very much tied to the price of oil. So as the gas prices went up, which are driven by oil prices, the revenue would go up. And that's been the big break in the gas taxes the, the doesn't tie to inflation. Right, it's not tied to inflation. And I know the governor was really, at, really promoting that he wants to solve this for a long term, not a one-time shot, so we don't have to keep going back to this keep discussion. Keep going back over and over and over again. Yeah. And meanwhile, the House Republicans have proposed using the budget, or the budget yep. surplus, the $1.2 billion, uh, shift some existing ta taxes, like perhaps car part sales, mm -hmm. to a dedicated transportation fund, and then use the annual public construction borrowing package to pay. Yep. And if that works, you know, again, <laughs> I, it's for the legislature and the commissioner and the governor to work out, how do we sustain it? Mm -hmm. Because this is not a one-time fix and we're done. This is a long-term need. Mm -hmm. Our transportation system was built over the last 100 years, mm -hmm. and it takes every part of it's in a different part of its life cycle, and it's not going to go away as a need. How long does a traditional road last? I mean, we talked about yep. half the state highways are 50 years or older. Is that past their prime? It depends on if you're talking concrete or asphalt. The 50 years is pretty much the end of a pavement. Okay. If you look at a, let's use just an asphalt roadway. You'll build a new road. It'll last 20 years before you probably need to do much work. You may then do a thin overlay or a thin milling overlay. Another 15 years later, you do a thicker overlay. Uh, you might be able to do that depending on the road, depending on the traffic, one more time. And then we'd probably do an a road reclaim where we come in, completely grind it up, put down another new surface, and you have a new road. Okay. 
but that's probably a 50-year cycle. Okay. Uh, we have roads, and you have to remember a lot of our infrastructure was built, a lot of our roads were built after World War II, and there was, most of our interstate was built in the 60s and 70s. That's all becoming due. That was built in a very short time frame, which is part of the reason there's this big need. And once you go in to fix what's already there, that's when you start looking at whether things need to be expanded and yeah. whether you need to handle congestion concerns yeah. and one everything of the, else. One of the issues the commissioner's talking about is modernization. Okay. If you look at the, the metro freeways are the best example, the easiest thing to use. When they were built, that was never visualized it would carry the traffic it does. And I know on Metro's list of expansion or, ne or modernization needs, if you ever drive 35W through Minneapolis, you have the 494 intersection on the south end of town, a very old design that carries well over 200,000 cars a day. That needs to be modernized to handle that traffic. It's a daily traffic jam, uh, and it is a challenge. Same could be said for 694 and 35W. Okay. And those numbers are staggering how much it costs. Uh, oh, if you look at 94 between Minneapolis and St. Paul's, another example, that was built, uh, we, they routinely go in and resurface it every four or five years at night, but the rest of the road is falling apart. Now you'd have to modernize not only the intersections, do you add high capacity lanes, do you add a bus lane? All that needs to be talked about. And we have the same in the rural area. Mm -hmm. You know, when every time a bridge comes up, it usually gets a little bigger, a little wider. You know. Are there ever any things that happens that causes a project to go from down here in the list to suddenly jump up higher? Uh, there's, in the past, uh, was there special funding? We'll do it. Okay. Um, we will sometimes do that when there's a local need okay. on a city. We'll work with them if they have all of a sudden need or they have money that we can, we, you know, we have money and we'll move it around to bat, best work with everybody. Mm -hmm. um, doesn't mean we have enough to do everything. So that, that's probably the biggest move. Or we'll see a sudden change in the pavement condition. Oh, okay. You know, and, and that's something I'm, I am concerned about in my chair is as our condition, conditions of our pavement worsen, our ability to predict exactly when we're going to have to work on it changes. So. I wanted to talk about one thing. We had talked about the dedicated long-term funding plan and wanting to make sure we have yeah. that that dedicated funding. One of the ideas that has been tossed out, and I don't know how serious if it's picked up a ton of steam, mm -hmm. but the, some GOP members have suggested a constitutionally dedicated funding by actually going in for a constitutional mm -hmm. amendment so that they can't play political football with the transportation funding. They can't keep taking it back. You know, any kind of long-term dedicated funding makes it easier to predict and to plan. Okay. We can be a better partner when it talks to the cities. When it's an unknown, it's harder to make that discussion. Okay. It's, well, it's not discussion, oh, sure. decision. Sure. Yeah. But it's also harder to make a, what type of investment should we make? Okay, interesting. Is there a set target number that MnDOT's aiming for that they would like the plan to come up with? I mean, I know we, I know we talked about some we, of these gaps, six billion, even more. There's been so many scenarios we've talked about and that's come through the commissioner working with the governor okay. to say what, what do we need to accomplish? We know the six billion does not meet everybody's need, but it's a, a reasonable amount that will mm -hmm. get to most of the issues. It'll at least solve yep. maybe some of those big, big problems yep. that are out there. Mm -hmm. All right, and then um, I wanted to talk a little bit about some of the projects that are coming up. I know that um, maybe outside of the Bemidji area proper, but you said there's a big project coming up in Baudette yes. that's going to impact quite a few people there. Do you want to talk a little bit about well, that? Well, if, if people are going through Bidet, and there's an exa example of projects when we were working with, that was supposed to be a very thin overlay. Uh, we started looking at the ADA, the handicap accessibility, the condition of the sidewalks, then talking to the city about the condition of their water lines. It went from a thin overlay to a three or four block reconstruction right downtown. And that's a challenge, and uh, we've been up and met with the city and the businesses and we're going to continue to meet with them and working with the contractor and we do things to try to accelerate contracts you know, cost a little bit more money but it's always a challenge when you're working in town mm -hmm. you know if the people in Bemidji know when we've gone through town or Park Rapids it can be a, a challenge or a painful experience in the summer <laughs> and you hope they uh, remember it's a short-term it's a short-term fix game. we're doing it as fast as we can yes yeah. 
And now another project that's going to have some pretty big impacts, right. even if it's not here specifically, is 371. And do you want to talk a little bit about that one from Pequot Lakes to Jenkins? Yes. If, if people drive through there now, they're probably observing uh, clearing. The, brush, the trees are being cut down. They're doing some site prep. Now, this year's construction is largely, well, it is all away from 371. The new alignment for the four lane will go east of Pequot. Okay. Um, so that's all gonna be done offline in this summer. So we really won't see traffic changes this summer. Okay. Next summer when they start tying in, you'll see some impacts. Okay. It'll be beneficial for it, many it, people. It'll help a lot of people in that area, yes. yes. And even for, I mean, even people from here who maybe don't live there, but travel that way quite frequently. Well, people that come up to visit, yes, it, it'll help. Mm -hmm. I want to talk a little bit about kind of future transportation issues as long as we have a few minutes left yeah. here about, you know, you got rail lines down or uh, light rail down in the cities, you know, yeah. you got driverless cars. I mean, how much of that is on, is always going through MnDOT's minds as you're planning for the future? It is. Um, one of the parts of our plan were what they call it Minnesota Go, where they actually went out and met with high school students, college students, uh, cross section of the population say, what's the future need? What do we want it to look like? If you're in Metro, um, I had the, I was able to meet with a number of the business leaders down there. Uh, they will tell you they're competing nationwide for people mm -hmm. to bring the brightest and the most talented in and transit's one of the issues people are bringing up that they don't necessarily want to be in a car. Mm -hmm. um, personal experience, my son lived down there for a few years and his roommates use as an example. Uh, they know they're going to work more than an eight-hour day. They were in the financial industry. They had to pay extra hours. They rode the bus. And the reason they rode the bus is they could sit on the bus with their laptop, work their way to work, work their way home, mm -hmm. and not be as... They used it as not just driving, but as work time. Yeah. So you need to work that in there. Uh, driverless cars, we, do, we are starting to investigate that to figure out what's that going to mean. Um, are there... Are there things we have on the books for expansion by the time we get there, the driverless car aren't going to need anymore? Because we're seeing that. <laughs> It'll be interesting yeah. to see how transportation changes as we head Very into the future. So. And I mean, it sounds like MnDOT is certainly keeping ears and eyes open as it heads that way. Yes. Well, we want to thank you, Craig, okay. for joining us today. And thank you for tuning in to Lakeland Currents tonight. Again, my name is Bethany Wesley, and I hope you'll join us the next time. Thank you. Mm -hmm.